Hello, here we are. We're going to have part two of Remember the Book we started last night, our new book that we're looking at, Diana Wynne Jones' novel Charmed Life, which is part of the Crestomancy series. This is book one. So, um, last night we, we just met a couple of characters. We discovered that, um, the, the, the Gwendolyn, that's it, of course, you've got to be used to these new names. Gwendolyn is a witch and she needs to be trained, but the lady they live with, Mrs. Sharp, they, being Gwendolyn and her little brother, Cat, um, can't train her. For, I can't remember why. Maybe we haven't discovered yet why she can't train her, but she can't train her, so she's got to go and see the nearby necromancer, which is Mr. Mr. Nostrum. I just had to scan the page. They missed Nostrum, but they couldn't afford it. And they've just found some letters from Crestomancy. We must realise that he's going to be someone important for, toward to her dad. And she said, I'll read the last paragraph. Yeah, that's right. And never you mind who he is, my love, said Mrs. Sharp. An important's a weak word for it. I wish I knew what your pa had said, something not many people had dare say by the sound of it. And look at what he got in return. Three genuine signatures. Mr. Nostrum would give his eyes for those, dearie. Oh, you're in luck. He'll teach you for those, all right. So would any necromancer in the country. So, apparently, Crestomancy's signatures can be used as currency. But we'll pick it up from there. We'll see if anybody trains Gwendolyn. Gleefully, Mrs. Sharp began packing the things away in the box again. <gasps> oh, what have we here? A little red book of matches had fallen out of the bundle of business letters. Mrs. Sharp took it up carefully and, quite as carefully, opened it. It was less than half full of flimsy cardboard matches, but three of the matches had been burnt without being torn out of the book first. The third one along was so very bent that Cat supposed it must have set light to the other two. Hmm said Mrs. Sharp. Oh, I think you better keep this, dearie. She passed the little red book to Gwendolyn, who put it in her pocket of her dress along with the earrings. And what about you having this, my love? Mrs. Sharp said to Cat, remembering that he had a claim too. She gave him the spray of white heather. Cat wore it in his buttonhole until it fell to pieces. Living with Mrs. Sharp, Gwendolyn seemed to expand. Her hair seemed brighter gold, her eyes deeper blue, and her whole manner was glad and confident. Perhaps Cat contracted a little to make room for her. He didn't know. Not that he was unhappy. Mrs. Sharp was quite as kind to him as she was to Gwendolyn. Town councillors and their wives called several times a week and patted him on the head in the parlour. They sent him and Gwendolyn to the best school in Wolvercote. Cat was happy there. The only drawback was that Cat was left-handed and schoolmasters always punished him if they caught him right in with his left hand. God, imagine if we did that. But they did that at all the schools Cat had been to and he was used to it. He had dozens of friends, all the same. At the heart of everything, he felt lost and lonely. So he clung to Gwendolyn because she was the only family he had. Just breathing deep because I was about to yawn. Gwendolyn was rather impatient with him, though usually she was too busy and happy to be downright cross. Just leave me alone, cat, she would say, or else. Then she would pack exercise books into a music case and hasten next door for a lesson with Mr. Nostrum. <laughs> Mr. Nostrum was delighted to teach Gwendolyn for the letters. Mrs. Sharp gave him one every term for a year, starting with the last. Not all at once, in case he gets greedy, she said, and we'll give him the best last. Gwendolyn made excellent progress. Such a promising witch was she, indeed, that she skipped the first grade magic exam and went straight to the second. She took the third and fourth grades together just after Christmas and, by the following summer, she was starting on advanced magic. Mr Nostrum regarded her as his favourite pupil, he told Mrs Sharp so over the wall. Gwendolyn always came back from her lessons with him, pleased and golden and glowing. She went to Mr Nostrum two evenings a week, with her magic case under her arm, just as many people might go to music lessons. In fact, music lessons were what Mrs Sharp put Gwendolyn down as having, on the accounts she'd kept for the town council. Since Mr Nostrum never got paid except by letters, Cat thought this was rather dishonest of Mrs Sharp. I have to put something, but... 
I have to put something by for my old age, Mrs. Sharp told him crossly. I don't get much for myself out of keeping you, do I? And I can trust your sister to remember me when she's grown up and famous. Oh, dear me, no, I've no illusions about that. Cat knew Mrs. Sharp was probably right. He was a little sorry for her. She would, for she had certainly been kind, and he knew by now that she was not a very good witch herself. That's probably why she doesn't want to train her. The certified witch, which the notice in Mrs. Sharp's parlour window claimed to her to be, was, in fact, the very lowest qualification. People only came to Mrs. Sharp for charms when they could not afford the three accredited witches further down the street. Mrs. Sharp eked out her earnings by acting as an agent for Mr. Larkins at the junk shop. She got him exotic supplies that is to say the stranger ingredients needed for spells, from as far away as London. She was very proud of her contacts in London. Oh, yes, she often said to Gwendolyn. I've got the contacts I have. I know for... Sorry, stifling a yawn again. I know those that can get me a pound of dragon's blood any time I ask, for all it's illegal. While you have me, you'll never be in need. Perhaps, in spite of having no illusions about Gwendolyn, Mrs. Sharp was really hoping to become Gwendolyn's manager when Gwendolyn grew up. Cat suspected she was, anyway. And he was sorry for Mrs. Sharp. He was sure that Gwendolyn would cast her off like an old coat when she became famous. Like Mrs. Sharp, Cat had no doubt that Gwendolyn would be famous. So he said, There's me to look after you, though. He did not fancy the idea, but he thought he ought to say it. Mrs. Sharp was warmly grateful. As a reward, she arranged for Cat to have real music lessons. Then that mare will have nothing to complain of, she said. She believed in killing two birds with one stone. Cat started to learn the violin. He thought he was making good progress and practised diligently. He never could understand why the new people living upstairs always banged on the floor when he started to play. Mrs. Sharp, being tone deaf herself, nodded and smiled when he played and encouraged him greatly. He was practising away one evening when Gwendolyn stormed in and shrieked a spell in his face. Cat found, to his dismay, that he was holding a large striped cat by the tail. He had its head tucked under his chin and he was sawing at his back with the violin bow. He dropped it hurriedly. Even so, it bit him under the chin and scratched him painfully. What did you do that for? He said. The cat stood in an arch, glaring at him. Because that's just what it sounded like, said Gwendolyn. I couldn't stand it a moment longer. Here, pussy. The cat did not like Gwendolyn either. It scratched the hand she held out to it. Gwendolyn smacked it. It ran away with cat in hot pursuit, shouting, Stop it! That's my fiddle! Stop it! But the cat escaped. And that was the end of the violin lessons. Mrs. Sharp was very impressed with this display of talent from Gwendolyn. She climbed on a chair in the yard and told Mr. Nostrum about it over the wall. From there, the story spread to every witch and necromancer in the neighbourhood. The neighbourhood was full of witches. People in the same trade liked to cluster together. If Cat came out of Mrs. Sharp's front door and turned right down Coven Street, he passed, besides the three accredited witches, two, necromanc necrom two necromancy offered, a soothsayer, a diviner, and a willing warlock. If he turned left, he passed Mr. Henry Nostrum, ARCM, tuition in necromancy, a fortune teller, a sorcery for all occasions, a clairvoyant, and lastly, Mr. Larkin's shop. The air in the street for several streets around was heavy with the scent of magic being done. All these people took a great and friendly interest in Gwendolyn. The story of the, cra of the cat impressed them enormously. They made a great pet of the creature. Naturally, it was called Fiddle. Though he remained in bad-tempered, capacious and friendly, and it never went short of food. They made even even greater pet of Gwendolyn. Mr. Larkins gave her presents. The willing warlock, who was a muscular-like young man and always in need of a shave, popped out of his house whenever he saw Gwendolyn passing and presented her with a bullseye. The various witches were always looking out simple spells for her. Gwendolyn was very scornful of these spells. Do they think I'm a baby or something? I'm miles beyond this stuff, she would say, casting the latest spell aside. Mrs. Sharp, who was glad of any aid to witchcraft, usually gathered the spell up carefully and hid it. But once or twice, Cat found the odd spell lying about. Then he could not resist trying it. He would have liked to have had just a little of Gwendolyn's talent. He always hoped that he was a late developer and that someday a spell would work for him, but... They never did, not even the one for turning brass buttons into gold, which Cat particularly fancied. The various fortune tellers gave Gwendolyn presents too. 
She got an old crystal ball from the diviner and a pack of cards from the soothsayer. The fortune teller told a fortune for her. Gwendolyn came in golden and exultant from that. I'm going to be famous. He said I could rule the world if I go the right way about it, she told Cat. Though Cat had no doubt that Gwendolyn would be famous, he could not see how she could rule the world, and he said so. You'll only rule one country, even if you marry the king, he objected. And the Prince of Wales got married last year. Ugh, there are more ways of ruling than that, stupid, Gwendolyn retorted. Mr Nostrum has lots of ideas for me for a start. Mind you, there are some snags. There's a change for the worse that I have to surmount, and a dominant dark stranger. But when he told me I'd rule the world, my fingers all twitched, so I know it's true. There seemed no limit to Gwendolyn's glowing confidence. The next day, Miss Larkins, the clairvoyant, called Cat into her house and offered to tell his fortune too. The next chapter, I'm going to guess, is when Miss Larkins tells Cat's fortune. Do you think Miss Larkins is going to tell him he's going to rule the world too? We'll find out tomorrow, won't we? There you go. So that was the first chapter of Charmed Life, but I did it in two parts. Like I say, the chapters are quite long, and I don't like to go too long with these, because otherwise you might fall asleep as I'm reading them, will not you? All right. Okay. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.